going to spend some time this evening sharing with you um, more about social impact at AT Kearney and what we do, how we think about it, and um, how it is integrated across everything that we do as a firm um, in terms of how we operate. So we've got a bit of an overview that I'm going to share um, after introducing myself. And then we've got uh, two folks who are going to introduce themselves and tell their stories and how they are connected to this topic. It's a topic that mo I assume everyone on this call has passion around. And certainly from the Kearney side, we have tremendous organizational passion for it as well. And so you'll hear from Dominique and Will some amazing stories and, and experiences. And then we'll leave time at the end for, for Q&A. You know, even though uh, we could all talk for hours and hours, we will keep it to the time frame limited um, uh, on, on the webinar. So first, maybe a bit about me, um, if we can go to the next page. Well, I don't know whether it flipped for other people. I'm having circle of death, but since I know who I am, um, I can talk to this page. Um, but my name is Beth Bovis, and I'm a, a partner based out of the Chicago office, though I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, I've made my career here at Kearney, um, working in, from a consulting perspective, in our leadership change and organization practice. And through that, many years ago, um, I started working and consulting with nonprofits, and I had always had in my personal life a lot of engagement, being on boards and doing service in my community, and um, had been able to uh, had been able to participate. And I wanted to bring more of that consciousness into what I did at work and at the firm. And so, um, so it started me on this journey to become the global head of our social impact work here. You can see the photos here, or I'm not sure if you can see them. On my webinar is stuck, but I don't know about other people's. But, um, but if you are seeing photos, you're seeing photos of some of the things that are most important to me, which is you know friends and family and colleagues. And so you see a picture of me with my, my children. Um, and, and with my husband um, doing some things we love. We spend time um, out in Alaska and in California hiking and um, exploring nature. You also see me with some of my colleagues and my, uh, and my project teams. I, I very much believe that and have experienced that you know, what, what we do at work is something that um, is something we do in a team environment and do together and, and you see there um, one of my uh, group of colleagues as we got together at Oktoberfest and another group as we uh, spent time in, together in Barbados um, at, the end, uh, at the end of a project. And, um, you know, and, and so this is just a little bit about me and, and who I am as a person. And then what I don't know is whether what you see at the bottom is um, it was my a playlist, but, um, but I'm having a little bit of webinar issue, Emily. So I'm just going to try to escape out and use the PowerPoint. Okay, that's good. I think it's working for others for on the line. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'll just, I'm just going to, just going to alt tab over and, Perfect, go to, and, and go to the PowerPoint. But, okay. So let's get into why we're all here on the phone, which is um, to talk about social impact. So, you know, it's not just me that's passionate about social impact at AT Carnegie. Our people are passionate, and this is something that we infuse across our culture and across all of our offices. So you, um, so you can see, you know, 100% of all of our employees um, have are supported by both a global social impact team that supports the globe, as well as local office teams. And in 70% of our offices, we have big formal teams. In all of our offices, we have social impact activity happening across the board. And, um, and we have the opportunity for offices to engage and um, they do things locally, but then also do things to contribute to the firm. So what you see here is a picture of an, uh, an event that happened in Chicago that uh, where we had the idea came from our employees. We have something called the Catalyst Fund we'll talk about in a little bit, where we fund the best ideas on how to increase social impact um, and scale social impact within AT Kearney. So this group came up with an idea about scaling, um, creating a hackathon model at, to which we could invite. We had over 50 companies participating to talk about how do you actually change the nature of work so that you can better incorporate um, 
a, a whole self and, and better incorporate time uh, to, to community into work. And so we, we did that, that hackathon focused on that. And then you see over there, we, we actually ask our employees um, all the time about what they think. And, and we have, you know, 94% of our employees, and I'm sure 100% of the people that are here on the phone think that this is an important part of what they want in their career and what they want from their employer. And we seek to mirror that. Um, with that, so here you see a team that um, locally got tremendously passionate about Habitat for Humanity, and both raised money and went out into the community to um, to build three homes uh, as a part of uh, you know a co-sponsored event together with Habitat for Humanity. So it's a big part of who we are and what we do, and we're very proud um, of, of how we think about it. So the next page. Um, it talks about how we think about social impact at AT Kearney. We, um, we allow our employees to engage in whatever passion they have in their community, so Habitat for Humanity, et cetera. But we set a standard for ourselves to say we want to be leaders in three areas, and we call them the three E's. But these are the three areas where we say we are not only going to participate from a social impact perspective, but we're going to lead. And that's around economic development, energy and sustainability, and education and workforce. And so when we talk about economic development, it's working with countries and um, quasi-government institutions and public-private partnerships around how do you look at sustainable and inclusive growth. I spent time with the head of the World Bank talking about what does it mean to engage um, and support fully employed um, women and minorities in countries and what could that mean for growth? And what if we stopped measuring GDP but instead measured what percent of, um, what percent of the people in your country are actively engaged in the education system and actively engaged in the workforce? And if that was the measure by which we, we looked at, at countries' success, what would that mean? And, you know, and, and that some of you may have seen the studies, it could mean some as, as much as like 8% growth in GDP for countries that are now very stagnant, like Germany and the US and, and France and others. Um, the second is around energy and sustainability, and this is one of the areas where we've taken a lead. Um, we do a lot of work um, and have always had a leading role in understanding um, how logistics and supply chains worked across the world. And we turned that expertise into expertise around how to actually create sustainability across um, supply chains and how do we look at energy differently, how do we look at the transition from um, into renewable energy differently, and we'll talk about you know our energy transition institute as well. But that's the other area where we've we've taken a leadership piece, and then as well embedded that on our own in terms of our own sustainability processes and our commitments to. Um, we we became the first consulting firm ever to be carbon neutral and have maintained that carbon neutrality throughout. Um, uh, throughout our tenure. And then education and workforce, and this is an area where we talk about what needs to happen to prepare for the workforce of the future, what needs to happen to education systems to be both inclusive but also change to the nature of work that is happening. And we just concluded a major study. We did um, research with you know, 30 companies and, um, and, and seven or eight countries in Asia talking about what does, what does that look like and we presented our findings at the World Economic Forum and, you know, and, and I'm very proud of we, we had someone in our audience who, who after we talked about the, this work and, and what it meant to empower youth to really um, change the way the world is, is going to operate, who said, you know, I've been coming to WEF for 10 years. We talk about this every year. This is the best conversation we've had about it. And, and so we're really proud about being market leaders in this space. And so I think, I, I've, though I've been talking on this one page, if we look on the next page, you see some examples of projects that we, um, that we've done in that space. And so I, I think I've talked about many of them, but you know, um, we certainly work across our client base and the sustainability and social impact base isn't just about working for nonprofits to help them be successful or partnering with nonprofits. It includes that, but it also includes working with our clients on their sustainability strategies, working with governments as clients to build things like we're helping build um, the health system in, in a country, helping to really position um, 
to position uh, one of the sovereign wealth funds to better um, give back to the development of community assets not um, within within their country. And then, you know, working with edu on education with organizations both who are educators, but then also folks like the Nike Foundation and others that are looking to enable um, youth and the workforce of the future. If I look at the next, um, the next page, you know, we're very proud of, of what we do. This is a firm-wide commitment. Um, so I mentioned being carbon neutral and having carbon neutrality, um, and we were the first firm to go carbon neutral. We have maintained it, and we continue to increase our standing relative to other metrics um, like Ecovada scores, et cetera. We were just honored by um, Consulting Magazine as outstanding for our social impact contributions, and we have been honored um, both this is a, a more North American piece, but also in Europe as well, um, having won uh, awards in Germany and France and other countries as well. Then we established the Energy Transition Institute, and this is an institute of leading thinking and research around what are the trends and what is happening as the world needs to move to more sustainable energy practices across the world and bringing together government leaders and business and academics to talk about what does this mean and to advise companies and, and those institutions on how they, can, um, how they can manage that transition. And then we're very proud of um, having been one of the first to sign up with um, the UN um, Global Compact and, you know, we have very specific, and if you went on our website and looked around, you can see you know, um, actions that we take both internally and also with our clients in support of the SDGs that have been set out by the UN. And you know, we're, we are, you know, this is something that sits both within um, the firm as a governance perspective, but also day to day, this is how we, we live and, and do our consulting work. So I think the next page talks about how would you get involved. So it's wonderful to hear me talk about all, all the things that, that we do, but um, we wanted to share with you how might it really look if you were at AT Kearney, how would you get involved with social impact? And, and you'll hear the best from it in terms of hearing Dominique and Will's story, but I'll just share a few things. The one is around client engagements. So in those three areas where we are leaders, we are actively out in the marketplace um, selling and doing work in that space. And so consultants who have passions on those topics can work in that, work in that space as part of their career. And, that's, um, and we, do not, um, we do not isolate this work, so we do it globally, uh, and we do it across all of our industry sectors. So one year we put a big effort in the textile and apparel industry, really working with change makers and, um, and with Ashoka to really think about that fabric of change. And that gets into this second piece because part of how we maintain our leadership and do this client work is through partnerships and alliances and thought leadership. And so we have a global partnership with Ashoka um, that we focus on and we, we've, we've been funding and we focus on um, one topic every year around which we jointly do research, um, share materials, convene um, change makers and work with them. In addition, we support, I think, 35 to 40 of their change makers and the Ashoka Fellows in coaching and mentoring around the world, and, they, and, and, um, and, and that's something that happens very much on a one-to-one -one or small team-to-one basis. We also, locally, where it comes up, use that partnership to convene. So one of the examples I'm most proud of um, happened in Mexico. Um, after the earthquake in Mexico, there were just a lot of agencies and a lot of organizations, government and private, that wanted to help rebuild um, the infrastructure and rebuild people's homes. But there wasn't really a way to coordinate and access, um, make sure people could access all of that and also to coordinate across it. We partnered with all those organizations, including with Ashoka, um, who, who actually said, let's bring A.T. Carney to the table. We came together and put together a 
both a governance mechanism and a coalition that enabled them to far more rapidly. And I and and if Ricardo were on the phone, he would be able to tell me exact, remind me exactly how much. But I think three times faster than they had anticipated, get the rebuilding done, because we were able to coordinate the government and nonprofit resources, make sure that the money got to the places, that the supplies got there at the same time as the money, at the same time as the resources, and really work on a coordinated effort. And and that in and of itself was was amazing. And and hearing the testimony from the from the folks who were who who were able to get back in their homes faster was was fabulous. But I'm even more proud about the fact that as the team was doing that, they were they were they were creating a model that could be replicated. So then when there was um, severe flooding and uh, damage in one of the regions in India. One of our partners in India was from there and his hometown was severely impacted. And he was able to take this model that we had created in Mexico and share it with the municipal leaders in his, in his home community so that they could look to replicate that, um, that kind of approach there in order to rebuild, um, rebuild quickly. And in addition to these things that we do globally, we also locally have partnerships. So every office has the opportunity to create local partnerships around issues and topics where they have passion. And you can get involved in all of those um, as part of what we call your firm building um, capacity. And so that, that's one piece. The other piece is in thought leadership. So we do take all of this work and we and we publish and we share it with the world because there's no point in hoarding social impact that would be go counter to our um, our vision so we often have opportunity for teams and individuals especially um, folks to help contribute to that research and the publication and then ultimately speaking um, about those uh, those publications at various events and you see some examples there um, you know, I'm going in two weeks to New York to speak about some work that we've done and research we've done on sustainable supply chains to um, a sub-summit of the World Economic Forum, and we continue on that front. And then internally, there's, you know, what I call the infinite opportunities. So what are you passionate about? Why did you get on this phone? Do you have a, a, a charity, a cause, an issue, um, a topic that you feel particularly um, uh, powerful about you have the opportunity to bring that into your local into your local office through a local um, initiative or volunteer event. Um, but it also could be that you want to have the experience of working in a nonprofit and working um, hands on on some of these issues full time. And we have a social impact externship program, which allows you to take an externship, a leave of absence from your consulting work, um, and with, with a stipend, because very often these um, organizations can't afford um, to, to hire interns, and do an externship with them to really get the experience of working hands-on. And we've launched that program and have um, and have the first class of externs are, are coming back into, back into the firm after their rotations, and it's, it's very exciting. And then also maybe you have an idea to do something even bigger than what I just described. We do have every year we run the Social Impact Catalyst Fund and we get suggestions from around the globe for ideas. So one of the winning ideas this year was the London office. Our London office came back and they've committed to by the end of 2020 to have eliminated all consumable one-time use plastic in their office, which is amazing. And we look at both what's an amazing idea, but what can be scaled. And so then we'll be able to scale that across all of our offices, which already have mandatory, um, certain mandatory green initiatives we do, but this will take it to a whole new level um, as the, the office thinks about things like ink cartridges and pens and all, and all single-use um, consumable plastic pieces. Another winning one this year is actually a team that is going to be working in Saudi Arabia to help put together infrastructure and put together public-private partnerships to give entrepreneur seed money to women um, who are, want to start businesses in the kingdom, which is obviously a massive um, social change and also um, a key to unlocking further growth in that, uh, in that region. So we're very proud of all of these things, and these only happen. I do not make these things happen. Uh, you and people like you, and you'll hear from Dominique and Will, are the ones who make them happen. And this is the ways in which you could be involved as you are when you are here. 
So with that, um, with that, I think we're going to transition to the um, to the different stories. And since my WebEx is still um, causing trouble, I don't know whether Dominique or Will is up first. So Emily, maybe. Hi, it's okay. me, no worries. It's you, okay, <laughs> excellent. So why don't you um, now hear from uh, Dominique. Hi everyone, thank you for joining the call today. I'm Dominique Harris, a principal in our Chicago office, and I am with our leadership change organization practice. As you can see on the slide here, there are a few details about myself. Um, I went to Vanderbilt for undergrad. I was planning to become a teacher and really got into, into consulting and actually never went into the classroom. Um, but in a few minutes, I'll give a few details around how I actually got into closer to teaching in a different way. Um, I started out as an analyst at AT Kearney, so I've been with the firm for about 10 years. I left for two years to get my MBA at Kellogg, which you can see the big K there. Um, I like to do cycling, um, particularly with Soul Cycle, and just got into some Peloton as well. And then, yeah, I'm from Chicago, so Chicago Bulls all day for me. <laughs> but I actually want to tell you a little bit of a story around how I was able to give back to my city. Um, a couple years ago, in summer of 2017, I worked for the Chicago Police Department. And this was in partnership with the Civic Consulting Alliance, which was one of, one of the pieces that Beth just highlighted. Um, in terms of how we partner with other organizations in order to make sure that we're bringing our expertise to um, nonprofits. And so particularly for this project with the Chicago Police Department, I was looking at the training that uh, police officers were receiving uh, post-cadet school. So if you're an officer on the force for two years or for 20 years, how much training should you be receiving, how many hours, and in what topics? And this was particularly inter um, interesting, but then also impactful given the social climate at the time, given a lot of the community and policing, um, I think, uh, disagreements and, and just the, the, the misalignment at the time. And so training was a real, a real hot topic in terms of how to prepare officers to really protect the community. And that's why I think this project really um, hits two of our pillars around education and workforce but then also around um, economic development in terms of improving livelihood of, of people and whatnot. And so nonetheless, so this project was really around um, three areas, uh, or two areas I should mainly focus on. One, just really understanding how they are currently um, conducting training and what are the best practices, and then two, around uh, really building out what they should do in the future state. And so every day for this project, I worked at the Chicago Police Headquarters. So I was with officers, captains, chiefs, and ultimately meeting with the superintendent. Um, to understand what they currently do, I went to the Citizenship, uh, Citizen Police Academy. I did focus groups with the, uh, in the police districts for all the shifts, um, and, and also just really got into a lot of their coursework. Uh, I also want to make sure, like we do in most of our consulting projects, want to make sure that we bring in best practices. So that meant looking externally to see what are other um, similar either, either um, departments doing or even going outside of the box and understanding what other sales teams are doing who are, have workers in similar positions in terms of being in the field. And so it was interesting because I was able to uh, interview and meet with New York Police Department, um, LAPD, but then also interview like Walmart and Kroger and understand how they're training their sales teams and what's the latest and greatest in teaching uh, police officers or just teams uh, different topics in a micro-learning type of way. Ultimately, we recommended 40 hours of training for the uh, police department and that was publicized to the city of Chicago as well as the core topics that we recommended and they, uh, and they actually are putting that into practice. Um, one of the key recommendations that came out of the project was around decentralized training. And so that's where you're really bringing the training to the districts and maximizing on the, uh, the, either the front end or the back end of a particular shift for an officer to give them 15, 20 minutes of kind of a micro learning or modular course. So it was an awesome opportunity where we were able to give back to the city, really get to see the change, um, and then for me personally, I was able to feel like I was making an impact and getting a different view from our officers who are protecting us every day. 
So with that, I'll actually pass it on to Will, uh, who will give more in terms of his experience with social impact. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Ritter. Uh, I'm an associate here in the Chicago office as well. Um, and I'm currently uh, dedicated work full time to our social impact uh, global team. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of similarities actually between uh, Dominique's and my story. Uh, Chicago's home for me. I was uh, as well. I was raised in the suburbs and um, went to Northwestern uh, for college. Um, where I studied cognitive science and psychology. Um, if any of you are uh, coming from similarly non-traditional backgrounds and thinking you're the only one, you're definitely not. Um, and moved to the city right after graduation uh, to start with AD Kearney right out of undergrad. Uh, during my couple of years uh, before business school, uh, I worked a good amount in like Dominique Leadership Change and Organization, as well as um, some work with consumer industries and retail and a splash of automotive work as well. Um, but I was kind of scratching the social impact itch with my work um, in our proud network, with the, which is our LGBTQ network. Um, so I was helping to lead undergraduate recruiting for the network um, and do other kind of cool initiatives um, with the community. And it was here that I really kind of came to understand that um, it was really the social impact type of work that was what I was passionate about. Um, and so uh, for me, uh, the, next, the next step uh, that made sense was to go uh, out west, first time away uh, from the Chicago area out to Stanford and uh, pursue an MBA focus in social innovation and public management. Uh, A.T. Kearney is uh, generous enough to offer uh, what's called the Scholars Program, uh, which means that uh, they can, that there's the opportunity for Carney to pay for your uh, MBA tuition um, if you come back and, and work for two years uh, after graduation. Uh, so I took advantage of this um, and ended up getting kind of the social impact focused MBA. Uh, over the summer, I, I did, this would have been slightly pre-externship program, but it was the pre-externship externship, I guess. Um, to a, a nonprofit in the Bay Area. Uh, it was the Cheryl Sandberg and Dave Goldberg Family Foundation. They operate leanin.org, which um, does gender equity work, and they operate optionb.org, um, which does work in building resilience for communities facing adversity. So being able to kind of immerse myself in the nonprofit world and understand how these organizations work, um, I was able to do really exciting work around um, building community for LGBTQ folks facing family and community rejection. I was able to build um, a, a workplace gender bias program um, and was able to kind of touch on a lot of different uh, cool projects and initiatives that, that really confirmed for me that, that this is the kind of work that I'm passionate about. Uh, so when it came time to, to come back to AT Kearney after I graduated, um, I started having conversations with, with folks around how I can kind of integrate this more uh, into, into you know, my, my full-time work, um, which is how I ended up being able to, to kind of serve on this global social impact team. Um, and what I do in this role is basically, uh, along with our global director of social impact, kind of help run and execute all the cool initiatives and programs and endeavors that, that Beth uh, talked about. Um, and so far, it's been just an incredible opportunity to work with people around the globe who are also passionate about this work and want to start cool initiatives and want to do an externship and want to do a pro bono project um, or start a green initiative in their office, you know, to eliminate single use plastics um, and really be able to provide opportunities for, for everybody um, who wants to do this work to be able to do the work. Um, and yeah, outside of, outside of uh, work, um, passionate about music, I was actually studying music cognition at Northwestern, um, so I like everything about it. Um, you'll see on the bottom right, I fancy myself a bit of a horror movie connoisseur. My friends might say that's an understatement. Um, and then on the top right, I like to hang out with my, my niece and two nephews there. Um, the smallest nephews just turned two months old. Uh, so that's a little bit about me and my story. And I think I'll turn it over to Emily uh, for Q&A. Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Will and Dominique and Beth um, for all sharing your stories and leading us through this presentation so far. Um, so we're gonna transition here. We have about 
10 minutes for questions that we've uh, been receiving, and you can still please feel free to send those, continue sending those through um, throughout this session as well. Um, I'm going to start this question off to Dominique and anyone else on the line. Also, please feel free to add in your experiences as well. But Dominique, can you um, expand on some of the examples about pro bono work at a that A.T. Kearney has done so far? Sure. So I would say that um, being in the Chicago office, beyond being able to be fully staffed on uh, pro bono projects, um, like, my, like I explained earlier, there's other opportunities to support nonprofit organizations, um, either through project work or just being able to um, commit a few hours um, of your day. So one example may be through um, junior achievement, um, how we uh, have partnered with the school Foster Elementary in the south side of Chicago to do junior achievement for the last, I would say, almost probably at least five plus years, 10 years um, since I've been with the firm. It's a great opportunity where we spend the day teaching um, business type topics to elementary school kids. Um, there's also opportunities where we have uh, partnered, I believe, with other organizations um, in the city, say, uh, I think there was a Chicago Food Depository um, as an example to do smaller projects that might not be pro bono, um, a full-time project, but might be something that you're doing in what we call your magic time because you care, because you want to make a difference. And then I would say the last thing, just to highlight about the Chicago office, and I believe other offices do this as well, is around uh, the, on Fridays, we have our Gene Fridays, and it's a time where you where we actually dedicate each Friday to a different organization. And you, when you wear jeans, you donate five dollars, and it's another way where we can raise funding for um, different nonprofit organizations. And we do that throughout the year, either through our our winter party or um, either supporting um, the uh, breast cancer walk that's coming up. And so I specifically spoke about Chicago, but that's an example of what we do locally. We do th very similar activities in San Francisco, um, in New York, um, in uh, Dallas. I believe we did something with the Boys and Girls Club recently. Uh, so those are a few other examples. Yeah, maybe Emily, I'll add a couple global examples in there for the, for the group, um, just a couple that I'm very proud of. So one example of the kind of pro bono work we often get asked to do is around helping um, someone who has started a social entrepreneurship um, um, company or a nonprofit to get them from the idea and initial execution into something that can really scale the impact that they're having. So we worked, we had um, one of our consultants in our Toronto office had a friend from university that had gone to Africa and he and his uh, wife had discovered an issue that is common not just in Africa but in many places uh, where the education of girls and the ability of women to participate in the workforce was hampered by the fact that they didn't actually have feminine hygiene products. So they created a, a, a company that employed exclusively women um, to manufacture, and I know this might sound um, you, know, you wouldn't think of this, but reusable feminine hygiene products that, that these women could uh, use and girls could use so that they could continue to go to school and work um, throughout, the, throughout the year. And they had, you know, and, and we helped them figure out what was the strategy go from, they, they were doing this, but, but not in a sustainable way, to be able to scale it and sustain it and create partnerships with organizations like um, UNESCO and, 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 the, and the UN and, and other global organizations that could serve as a distribution channel to make sure that their products got to women all over the developing world. And so that was you know, one pro bono project I was very uh, proud of. Another out of our German office was um, with the influx of refugees into Europe. This group worked together with a nonprofit and with the government of their city to actually create um, to create a training model and 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 kind of end-to-end, -end, if you will, process 
so to teach refugees, um, all of whom had skills that they, they had from their home country, but no ability to put those skills to work in their current country, to help them start businesses, launch, um, launch careers, and become integrated into the community. And so that nonprofit had been looking for um, support. They didn't know how they, they were doing it in a onesie twosie manner. They didn't know how to take what they were doing in individual counseling and create a model that could be scaled to the level of refugees that were coming into um, southern Germany. So those are, those are a couple examples of other pro bono work that we've done that I'm very proud of. Great, thank you both. Um, and this next question I'm going to direct to Will. Um, so we've talked a bit about how to get involved as a new hire in some of these social impact initiatives and programs that we have, um, but what advice would you give to uh, a new hire, someone that's juggling both their passion for social um, initiatives and also their full-time project work? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the things when I first started out of undergrad that was most striking to me about AT Kearney, um, that's probably kind of a product of, of our scale, um, is that while we have the, the global reach and resources of, you know, the large, the large firm that we are, we also um, are very kind of nimble, and, and I think everyone feels a, a sense of, um, ability to affect change uh, in, in the organization where they see an opportunity. So um, when I came in, just as an example, we had no undergraduate LGBTQ recruiting at all, you know, um, and, and which, which everybody, you know, as, as kind of the question implies, everybody has their, their project work and their, and their priorities and um, it's kind of on everybody to make things happen. And so, um, you know, before I had hit my six month anniversary, I think that I'd, I'd been empowered by the partners in our, in our proud organization to, to go ahead and create it and kind of start building a team and, and, and kind of uh, make something out of nothing. Um, and the, the, the firm is really, uh, is, is really encourages um, that, that kind of, uh, that kind of change making, which is exciting. Um, so if it's something that you have a passion about, um, like this was for me, um, or it's a, it's a local organization that you're excited about serving, um, or um, it's, a, it's a catalyst fund idea that, that you heard in the office and, and want to be a part of, um, it's all about balance. So um, finding, finding and making time to kind of pursue your, pa your passions um, alongside what, what you're kind of doing on your project. Thank you, Will, and I have to say I worked with you on this and I was so proud of the, the impact that you made um, with our undergrad recruiting on that, so thank you. Thanks so um, much. <laughs> um, all right, so the next question we have here, I'm gonna direct to um, Dominique. So given the firm's commitment to social impact, do you feel empowered to bring these passions to the clients that you're, you're working on uh, outside of the, the, the social impact um, projects themselves, but in different practices and projects as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, you're able to show up as your full self and really be able to show what you're passionate about, even on the client site, and, I, and we support our consultants in doing so. And I think one thing I was particularly happy and really proud about is uh, last year a client, I was supporting a client with their, with their global leadership workshop, and as part of that workshop, on one of the days they asked their leaders to stay late and to um, pack uh, packages for um, our, um, for our armed forces abroad and to pull together like little kits and whatnot. And it was just an exercise, um, some team building exercises, but then ultimately you were doing good for the community. And I had the option to go home and to work on some of our deliverables, et cetera, but um, I, encourage, I encourage my team and me myself decided to stay late, enjoy the time to be able to give back to the community and, and work with our client in doing so. And so I think um, 
even on your project teams, it's encouraged, it's welcomed, and you'll find that a lot of our clients have passion for it too, and we can support them in that. Great, thanks, Dominique. Um, and I think we have time for one last question here, and I'm going to have um, all three of you answer. I'll start off. Um, I'll have uh, Beth, you share uh, your answer first. But can you share some upcoming initiatives, so whether some local partnerships or thought leadership that you're working on that you are most excited about? That's I, that, that's a great question, and and I have so many. Um, I'll, I'll share. I always break the rules. Um, and so I'll share I'll share a couple that I'm that I'm particularly excited about. Um, one is something that Will and I are working on, which is internal, uh, but very very exciting. We are working to take everything that we just talked about and and amp it up one more level within the firm. So expanding the number of internships in the Catalyst program, expanding the amount of pro bono work. Also thinking about how we um, can do even more in terms of how we travel and do work to um, to lessen our impact on the environment. Thinking, but but I'm particularly excited about some of the work we're going to do to think about how right now in most of our client engagements we bring social impact to to the the table. And when I say most, it's maybe you know two two thirds. But, but we're going to work on how do we actually bring this to nearly all of the client engagements that we do, where we're bringing this mindset and, and bringing this forward. And that means, you know, a, 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 an, an extra commitment. And we have the support of our board and our leadership to, to go after that. So I'm, so I'm very excited about that internal work. And then, you know, externally, I'm, I'm quite excited about um, – some collaboration that we're going to that we're doing um, in Europe um, with business as a force for good, and um, it's in partnership with Enciad and with Ashoka and with um, some other companies, and we all connected when we were at the World Economic Forum, and it, it's it's coming together to be an opportunity and a forum for us to really change things. And we've got two clients that we're working with right now to fundamentally think about how could they actually rethink their entire business model from a social consciousness perspective. And we've got um, running sessions with their leadership team and with um, change makers and with other thought leaders about how might you really fundamentally think a consumer goods business or an industrial business with this mindset of social consciousness. And, you know, and so I'm so excited about those are things that used to get talked about, but now they're actually conversations that we're having and things that are actually um, starting to materialize and not just be theoretical conversations. So that's some of what I'm very excited about. I'll go next. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about, um, I guess, a couple things. One would be just continuing with our partnership with the Civic Consulting Alliance um, and the work in the city of Chicago. I know we just finished up some work with the Chicago Housing Department um, and even looking at the Civic Consulting Alliance itself in their operating model. And so I'm excited for what else we're going to help the city with. Um, and then I'll say the next thing I'm excited about is just working with the organization called Common Purpose, which is a global organization that helps to build lead, um, young leaders. And how are we going to be able to possibly partner with them in the future, either by supporting their work in Chicago or even um, bringing them to some of our other global offices? So I will um, plus one everything that we've heard so far. Um, I think for me the the stuff that I've been most excited about recently um, has been the work that um, the the finalists in our Catalyst Fund have been doing. Um, so we mentioned a couple. We we mentioned Plastic Free London, um, and we we mentioned um, uh, encouraging the team that's encouraging. Um, women in Saudi Arabia uh, to, to pursue social entrepreneurship. Um, there's also a, a team working on um, providing better education for, for Syrian children um, following the Civil War. Uh, and uh, the team that I'm, that I'm also excited about that I just spoke to this afternoon um, is called AI for Good. 
um, which is basically gener uh, creating creating events and hackathons um, to kind of get at uh, how can we how can we harness the the power of AI for for kind of good causes and and um, using this in, in a specific instance for uh, what they call hacking the global food chain, which is really how can we convene um, you know industry leaders. Um, and, and technologists and data scientists um, and really figure out how we can apply AI um, as a tool to uh, eliminating food waste throughout the value chain across the food industry, um, which I think is a really exciting initiative and, and we'll see kind of where all of these teams uh, are able to take, take this work. Great, thank you all. Um, I'm going to um, transition into the best ways to stay connected with us after this webinar. So our contact information is up on the screen. Um, please continue the conversations with us by reaching out to us directly uh, or visit our Social Impact website there. Uh, we'll also follow up with a link to that as well. Uh, Norbert and myself will stay on the line and answer any of those questions that are still coming through the chat function. Uh, but I just wanted to take a moment here to thank you all for joining our webinar this evening. Uh, this is a highly requested topic, so we, we all hope that you found this discussion interesting as you be, begin to start meeting different firms throughout the recruiting season. Uh, with that, just have a great evening, um, and thank you all for joining again. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, Thanks, bye. Thank you.